This episode has been sponsored by TCG Player and the new D&D Magic the Gathering set, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Click the link in the description below to check out the cards on their web store for yourself. They have everything from singles to the ultra fancy collector's boosters if you want a better chance at the alternate art cards. Thanks to TCG Player for supporting the channel. And now let's start the show. Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today I'm joined with a number of people from around the OSR and we're doing something a little bit different because we're going to talk about Magic the Gathering. Uh, in case you're not aware, uh, Magic just put out a new set of cards, which is set in the Forgotten Realms, which is a D&D universe, in case you weren't aware. And we have been checking it out. We've been talking it, uh, about it a lot on Discord, and I figured we could jump online to discuss cards that we thought were interesting and uh, what we liked and what we didn't like and stuff like that. Um, but before we start, let's go around and just introduce ourselves so everyone knows who you are. Um, Brendan, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, so I'm not sure how much info we, we want here, but uh, I blog at um, necropraxis.com, mostly play old school varieties of D&D. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good intro. It's been a while since yeah. I've actually played Magic. Yeah, I think that's true for all of us. We're all pretty much noobs or we've just got into Magic recently. Um, I play it really casually. But uh, we know enough to know how the rules work, so we can critique it on that front. But we're not going to get any really detailed analysis of the cards, I don't think. Um, uh, Chris, go ahead. So my name is Chris McDowell. Um, I designed Into the Odd and Electric Bastionland, and I blog at bastionland.com. Um, and yeah, I'm similar to Brendan. Um, I, I did play Magic when I was like a teenager, um, not very seriously. Um, and then I've kind of dipped back in once or twice in the remaining 20 years. And uh, I've, I've sort of weirdly, I, I wish it wasn't true, but the D&D set has somehow brought me back in, which is exactly what they wanted to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's indirectly dragged me back. I guess that's partially what this video is about. How successful is this set at actually attracting D&D players? Mm. So is this set about dragging D&D players into magic or vice versa? I'm not totally sure but probably supposed to capture us, I would guess. Yeah. Um, Scrap, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Scrap Princess, artist um, of books such as Fire and the Velvet Horizon, uh, Deep Cavern Observatory and Vents of the Earth, um, and the blog Monster Manual Sewing from Pants. Um, yeah, I was familiar with magic in high school, but I like, kind of like we were being a bit hipster back back then and would like play other card games and kind of look down at magic for being like too expensive and you know like basically having the same flaws as the card games that we were playing um but yeah recently like reading about uh cubes and you know cube the cube format and magic the gathering has made me uh interested enough in it that i'm trying to learn how to play it and yeah to that end i've been pestering friends of magic cards to sort of uh, play games with me and been playing a bit of magic the other ring arena yeah so sort of a it was sort of a coincidence that it sort of happened about the same time as the forgotten realms uh magic the gathering set cool all right um well let's jump into it and pick some cards to talk about we'll just go around in a circle i guess let's just start with brendan again you have a card that you thought was interesting Sure. Uh, let's pick one that's kind of a little bit of jokey to start with. So split the party. Mm. Yeah. Um, just to, I'll, I'll briefly say the, the mechanics of this, which is that uh, choose target player and you return half the creatures they control to their owner's hand rounded up. Um, and then the, the text is don't, which is, you know, that common thing. Don't split the party. Um, so I, I, Pick this one first, just because I think that it's uh, one. It's trying to tap into the I don't know the memosphere or whatever you want to call that of D and D players, um, and to do it in a way that's maybe kind of catchy. But also, it's actually a really dramatic magic effect based on at least my memory of what that would do to a game where half of the creatures a player controls returns to their hand. It could, in, you know, if 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 your end game, that's like what I don't know five, 10 creatures, maybe, maybe even more depending on the game, right? So that could totally swing the game. Um, and doesn't, I guess it's a mid cost in terms of mana. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the cards in the set 
are trying to capture, yeah, like you said, the memes, the internet talking points, like the things that people hear when they hear about magic or hear about D&D oh. &D, and trying to put them into card form. And I think it does a pretty good job, like actually capturing mechanically something that happens in um, in D&D, &D, which isn't always true with a lot of these cards. I think it does that pretty well. I think I it's good that it does that in quite a, it does that in relatively few words as well, which is the, the thing about magic that I like is, um, when you get a card that's able to do something like this that uses a few words to do something that fits the theme and is that mechanically interesting and I think as we'll see they they kind of manage that to various degrees uh, throughout this set I think yeah it, it, it is fun mechanically I think but it's oh. also uh, there's a, a recurring theme to some of these these cards at least the ones that I picked which uh, is that the color choice seems to either be Kind of strange maybe nonsensical in some cases and or arbitrary like split the party why is it blue i mean i understand why it's blue in terms of the effect and and how cards tend to work <laughs> in magic but it could have e just as easily been many other colors right there's nothing particularly bluish about this spell as far as i can tell blue is like the control color right i think cards that return like cards that return cards to hand, I think are quite often blue. Right, M mechanically it makes sense, but in terms yeah. of the, you know, what what is fictionally supposed to be going on in this oh, stuff, yeah. right? It's like not yeah. obvious. It's not like a fireball or uh, a skeleton yeah. or something like that. No, that's true. Yeah. Like a, a lot of this, like a lot of the cards, it's interesting because you're trying to picture what it's trying to represent happening in the magic world. Um, oh. which gets harder to visualize because the only way this makes sense is if like you are in the position of like a dungeon master and the other person is the player and you're like dividing their party but like that's not the stance of like people playing magic yeah, yeah that makes sense. i thought it was maybe like red and it represented like people being impulsive and going ah oh, you guys you guys go that way you guys go that way because generally they don't split the party thing it's about it's it's a advice to the PCs like don't be like hey we'll go this way and that way rather than to the DM you know like like because I guess split the party is both it's a headache for DMs but more but like more importantly it's a technically a bad idea for PCs so you know it would make more sense if it was maybe like a red card maybe with a different effect or something and that mm -hmm. in that kind of way. You know, it doesn't like make any like... colors. Sorry, Brendan, go on. Yes, sorry to talk over you. Um, or some combination of colors, maybe. There's a lot of multicolored cards in this set, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Just from my recollection of what magic sets normally look like. But there's a lot of treasure tokens, too, which seems to make up for that. I think they, I think they splash a lot more colors than they sort of used to. I think people are a lot more... Uh, I, there's a lot more cards that enable like, putting two or even three colors of magic than they used to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, there's the commander effect that we're seeing, like the popularity of like the commander format, I guess, suits multicolored cards a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone um, uh, talking about the Into the Dungeon mechanic and the like, list of cards they're talking about? Uh, I have a dungeon in, in my set. I'll, I'll bring mm -hmm. one of those up. Uh, That's like cause I, cause things. Because I think that whole Into the Dungeon mechanic is kind of a sort of example like split the party where it's kind of confusing exactly what is happening in world as such you know like you play this card and then the card isn't entering the dungeon it's not like a uh exile this card and then that card goes off it's kind of quite there isn't really a framework to sort of understand who is entering the dungeon and what's happening that that feels extremely sort of detached and abstract which is you know, neither here or there, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, if you went through these cards and were like, these cards, you know, have a quite a detached mechanic, you know, and these other cards kind of make quite a lot of sense if you're trying to picture the game of Magic as a coherent thing. Yeah, I yeah, think well, that's one of, like, the big design challenges when they were creating this set was how do you incorporate tropes from both of those things? Or one, like, Magic is yeah. just a wizard battle. That's what it is. And D&D is a totally separate thing. You want to try and get them both. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris, do you want to go on to one of your cards? Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, if, if we can kind of pick them out of order, 
Sure, um, whatever. Just to, make, just to make things confusing. Um, it kind of fits in with um, one of the ones that I chose is called um, You Happen on a Glade. Oh. Um, and it was kind of for the same reason. So it's um, it's another one of these instants that kind of is meant to try and capture, like, I guess, like a narrative moment from an RPG. So it's an instant and it's green and it says choose one. You can either journey on, which essentially lets you get some cards out of your library, or you can make camp, which means you return a target for, a target permanent from your graveyard to your hand. So it's like an instant that does two things. Um, and this is, I thought, was one of the two that kind of works slightly better um, in terms of feeling like you can at least kind of imagine this is what your, your like planes, if you're the planeswalker in this kind of fiction of being magic. Um, this is something that the Planeswalker is doing. But then there were a lot of other ones that felt like, depending on which option you chose, it was like sometimes it was something that was happening to you or it was happening to the other player. And oh. it's and be because they're instants, they, they, they can happen like in the middle of combat as well. So it's oh. it's like you got this combat moment, and then it's like, well, no, I'm going to go go into a glade. It, 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 fe it feels strange, but I guess that is part of the challenge of combining essentially two completely separate types of game yeah. into, into one. Um, but yeah, I, th I thought this one was out of all of that type of card. I thought this is the one that made the most sense, but I'm kind of damning it with faint praise. Um, really. <laughs> yeah. I really like the, the two options thing. Um, and some of the cards even have three options where you could tell that's one of the ways they were trying to bring the RPG ness into the game mm -hmm. was giving you choices um, that you could pick from. So you feel like you're going down branching paths. And I really like the way that there's keywords where it tells you specifically what each effect is supposed oh. to represent. Because mm -hmm. that's the first time I think they've done that in Magic. And it's one of my favorite things about the set that I wish they would continue doing because it's oh. really flavorful. But like you're saying, it not, doesn't always quite work. Like making camp where you're returning a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand, I guess that's like re recovering spell slots, yeah. right? Because like you're getting spells back that you can cast again. So that, yeah. I guess that yeah. would make sense. Or like casting a resurrection spell or like if someone's got lost, you kind of, you know, you make camp and they catch up with you. Sure. I guess yeah. it's an instant than, than a sorcery, which is, you know, probably makes a lot more sense in the magic meta to be an instant. But, you know, an instant means it can happen in the opponent's turn or can happen kind of mm. during like a stack of cards happening in combat. While if it was a sorcery, you know, it would feel very like you, the planes worker, were like taking a chance to kind of like, restock and recamp and resupply i'm almost surprised that they didn't kind of make this a new like i think they call it like a super super type is it where oh. it's like um like you have enchantments but then you have enchantments that are also an aura for instance like yeah I'm surprised they didn't have something for this kind of like moment i guess or like a narrative like a that sort of narrative choice thing <laughs> because like Scrap was saying, I think they they, they would it, it might feel better if it, if it, if the the timing was a bit more restricted yeah. Maybe because having I the think... idea of having like two or three of these play play off in the stack in the middle of like a busy combat feels a little yeah. bit a little bit strange. I guess with the end of the dungeon mechanic, you know, being its big mechanic, I think they, I think some sets they sort of add a lot of extra mechanics and sometimes kind of look like they almost regret that. Um, I think Zeneca had like a party mechanic which they never really felt like like supported well enough and people sort of complain about it and so maybe with this one i think they didn't want to go too nuts with the mechanical power and think and maybe they didn't want to put too many crazy um new card types or new things so i think they yeah kept it to just the into the dungeon mechanic and classes like that's a new thing right oh yeah yeah that's new i mean it, that's quite similar to how they've done the sagas previously and that that, that yeah. seems quite elegant, you know. Like mm. it's representing D and D. It's a new idea, but it's quite similar to an old idea, with, without just being a reskin, you know. You it was fun. It's, I, I kind of like the implementation of classes, but it's also it doesn't feel like the cost of raising your level is just spending a little bit of mana. And yeah, I'm remembering how they all work. They all have three levels, so it seems like the kind of thing you kind of blow through relatively quickly within a game yeah. rather than the central uh, goal of, you know, playing a D and D mm. game over many years and slowly getting up to 10th level or 15th level or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's a weird mix there where it's a, the, the blend works, but also doesn't quite mm. work. Yeah. 
Yeah, Scrap, you had a, a class on your list, didn't you? Yeah, um, that, that was more just complaining about the art. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tried to like keep my ratio of how many cards I'm complaining about the art for. Um, yeah, it was just the monk class, I think. Basically, I don't like any of the class art, but I think out of all of it, just the monks kind of like just wrapping up their hands, I think is pretty, I kind of get that they were trying to simplify all the classes down to their like key equipment. And they were trying to sort of say monks only use their hands, but yeah, I reckon it would have been cooler if they did a saga style, like, uh, like, almost like a montage. So at the top of the card, they've got the classes like doing low level class stuff. And then, you know, the mid level, like position the card, like, you know, they have like the monk drop kicking someone or doing something and then, you know, at the higher level at the bottom that, you know, but yeah, just kind of a shot of the, of some adventuring gear or a shot of their hands or the sorcerers, like weird shot of the braces. I just, nah. You know, like what, what strikes me now, I just noticed this, is I think most of the the class spells are almost like first person views, as it's like yeah. you looking down at yourself as that class. Like maybe, yeah, that's yeah. What, maybe that's what they were going for. Yeah, um, yeah. Because you never see like an actual person's face, I don't think, in any of the classes. It's yeah. always like zoomed in on just like part of their body or their equipment. But then it's sort of the druid and the rogue kind of have a slightly different effect going on where they've just got like a little almost, almost like little shrines to the, their gear or you know their, their symbols and stuff maybe it's so that you yeah. could like multi-class so if you're like a monk and like a ranger you could have like these two cards side by side in yeah. your enchantment area or whatever and yeah. it'd be easier to visualize that like oh i'm wrapping my hands because i'm a monk <laughs> now but i also have this thing because i'm a ranger now and you can just sort of put that together because yeah, originally I thought that classes were things you put on your creatures. It was only when oh. I read it more carefully, I'm like, Oh, it's you, you're actually yeah. becoming a D and D class. Well, they kind yeah. of did oh. classes on creatures already with, um, I think it's like the Zendikar set. Um, yeah. so like a big focus of that set was this idea of having your party. Like it, it, yeah. it's exactly what you'd expect to be in this set, but they already did it like two years ago. <laughs> yeah. Two years ago. So th this is just kind of the, I think this is part of the problem when you, I say problem, it's just part of the thing when you've had a game that's been around for this long and mm. has had to make four new sets every year. Like they've, they've, they've done like traps as a mechanic and they've done classes as a yeah. mechanic. So they, they can't just do it again. Um, which when they've got all the freedom in the world to like make the next set, yeah. you know, the next set that's set in like the magic multiverse they can make it whatever they want thematically mm. but I, I think from memory i think it's not the first time they they were perhaps more restricted in that sense and yeah it, it must have been painful to, to to not be able to use a lot of these classic dnd tropes that they've already kind of visited in in previous yeah. sets especially the like the first alpha set and something they were like mining heavily the kind of fantasy dnd troops and i think the yeah there was some um, of the creators, you know, they have stuff on the website where they sort of talk about designing the set, and I think they will. Oh, I don't, maybe I read it there. I'm not sure what they were sort of talking about. Oh, you know, they'd already had like tree ants and elves and stuff, so they sort of had to like dig a little bit deeper, but then also not get too deep because I think they, if it's not magic lore, they try and not like alienate people too much by making them look something up, which I kind of. I'm a bit dismissive on, you know, they're prepared to have pretty obscure magic references, but then, you know, like the one that played around with the Ar Arfian Grail kind of stuff, you know, they kept it pretty simple. And yeah, there's, there's stuff on the net about how the set designers, you know, we're going to do it this way, but then there's like a team in house that will kind of push back if stuff that has two deep law dives outside magic law. Yeah. I mean, there's like a lot of the mechanics on some of these creatures that uh, online we were talking a lot about how you would make them more like their D and D selves, but it's yeah. really hard to judge to what extent they had to be that way, either because it's yeah. too complex or because um, like the set required it. You can't have all the creatures just be super thematic because it might not yeah. work as a, you know, the correct spread of different abilities. Yeah. Um, I feel like they, they, there was a certain percentage that they were like, these ones were going to push really hard thematically. Like Telephonous cube seems to be like, perfect for like the design um and then these other ones that felt like they had to support 
uh, the treasure token mechanic or they had to support a color identity or they had to support um they say treasure tokens or entering entering the dungeon mechanic or treasure tokens you know or yeah. some other kind of meta reason that's you know presumably opaque to run outside the magic in-house design team a few of them actually did that did that well though it's like that there, <laughs> there were somewhere they seemed to need an effect and they just need to slot it in but like one of the other ones i chose was grim bounty which is basically yeah. a terror that turns a creature into a treasure token so it's like you're shanking someone oh, yeah. taking their stuff and that's perfect right and it's a good card yeah. too so or at least superficially it seems so i have no idea how it compares yeah to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, the only judge it by how much it like appeals to us that's the thing uh let's look at one of the the dungeon cards because that's one of the big things from the set so the one I had was Tomb of Annihilation, because that seemed like the most different of the two, of the three. There's three different dungeons you can play. As far as I understand it, dungeons are tokens, so there's no cost for them. I think you can just have them out whenever, if I understand correctly. Um, no, they're not quite tokens, but they're tokens in the sense that they are like a bonus card that you don't have to have in your deck. Okay. You don't have to summon, you know, um, and... The ways of mechanically interacting with it are pretty limited. Like I don't think you can target it with with most spells. I think only stuff that mechanically interacts with it other into the dungeon mechanic stuff. Yeah, like if you look at the card, it doesn't even have like dungeon as like a keyword on it anywhere. You just have to sort of yeah. recognize that it is one. Um, and m most of them are, you know, it's it's a flow chart basically of different decisions that you can mm -hmm. make. And uh, they're usually all really positive. So you, uh, you want to go through the dungeon rooms because every time you go through another one, you get some sort of usually pretty minor benefit. And there's usually something good at the end. Um, Tomb of Annihilation is odd in that uh, a lot of them are really negative. Like you start out by everyone yeah. losing one life. And then the choice is each player loses two life unless you discard a card or Ubelet, where you have to discard a card and sacrifice yeah. something else. And then they're all negative until you get to yeah. the very end where you get to create a legendary 4-4 Black God Horror yeah. creature token with Death Touch, yeah. which is you know not a bad creature, but that doesn't seem fantastic for what you had to go through to get there. Yeah. I guess it's like that's added value, you know, because the a lot of the Into the Dungeon mechanic, it's, I don't, I, you're getting like, you're playing a, a, a creature and then as well as getting a creature, you're getting an advancement of the dungeon. So that one, you know, if you're playing a bunch of cards that head into the dungeon mechanics, you know, you, you're like, oh, cool. Every two free creatures I play, I also get this God horror, you know? Yeah. I mean, since like everything on the left side of the path is negative for everybody, I suppose this could be a good card to play if you are already ahead. And then you could go through yeah. the dungeon quickly. Everyone is losing life, but you're ahead. Yeah. So they run out faster. Then you get something nice at the end and you hit them with it. Or if you have some yeah. way of like, again, the, the problem with, again, having like 5,000 cards or whatever there is, is um, there will be some card where it will mitigate all these negatives. Mm. So I guess that's oh. another way of looking at it is that it's, yeah. there will be some build where like you want to go into the Ubiet and discard all those cards so, yeah. in the great, so that they're in your graveyard and then you can access them from your graveyard or something mm. like that. Um, which again is it's it's weird narratively because it's like it feels like you're trying to play D D and play magic at the same time yeah, yeah. well then it may seem to be a lot of common ground um mm. that there are these weird things that do slightly bump up against each other which isn't a disaster but um it's it is like sort of noticeable i feel like some of the older sets also did a little bit better job with uh integrating their whatever their thing was into kind of your imagined tableau of mm. the fight between wizards or whatever it's supposed to be, you know, like yeah. Ice Age where there's snow everywhere or legends where, yeah. I don't know, all of these heroes are coming back, that sort of thing. I think, yeah, the early ones, they didn't even really consider the, the game as a whole or, or like any form of meta. They were literally like, hey, this would be a cool effect. Hey, this would be a cool effect. And hence why the Power Nine exists, you know, because they're like, yeah, have a card that gives you an extra turn. That sounds fun, you know? Um, and then there was like way later a, a time where they were just not even doing thematically anymore. They were just having like effects for the sake of effects. And like people started complaining about that because they're like, oh, you know, like what, what's happening? You know, like, I don't, you know, there's no 
sense of an imaginary battle anymore. And then I think they started moving back to sort of like simple kind of thematic effects, like a Hydra, you know, like the card has like five tokens on it, each plus one. And it's like, oh yeah, cool. It's got like five heads and like, it's powerful because it has so many of them. So I think this kind of set is an is example of kind of modern magic where there's like a real balance of like stuff that's quite thematic and then stuff that supports like the meta meta-ness of the cards all interacting with each other. I think if I'm recalling correctly, maybe there are some uh, cards that key off having completed a dungeon. Yeah. Um, yes. Which yes. is oh, yeah. kind of a cool idea, I guess, because you succeeded, you got some treasure or whatever. Uh, Aserax, the Blitch from the Tomb of Annihilation, um, I think you if you play him, he just goes straight either to the graveyard or your hand or exiles himself unless you've completed the Tomb of Annihilation. So I guess it's another benefit of Tomb of Annihilation is then you can play Aserak well. Otherwise, I think you have to get around it with specific card effects. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, I think it's the shortest dungeon if you take the right-hand path. So yeah, you yeah. could just play it and then just like blitz your way through the right-hand path and then get yeah. all the effects for having finished something. That would make sense. Um, Brendan, do you have another card? Let's go with Wish next. OK. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is, you can play any card you own um, from outside the game, which is really powerful. And I'm pretty sure that's not going to be legal in anything in a while mm. um, <laughs> uh, for a number of reasons. But this is also, it's red which is super weird. It's not what I would have chosen for Wish. Um, I probably would have made it blue or all colors if it was going to be anything. I guess it's like Uh, Desire, maybe? Yeah. I think if I get wistfulness, if you wanted to kind of like shoehorn it in, but no, it just doesn't fit. I don't think it's it's strong. (laughs) And the art is also terrible. Yeah. That's that's why I got on my list. Like of all the things you could ever wish, it's barred in front of a fire like playing a loop like really (laughs) it's uninteresting and pretty much uh, sorry i hope the artist isn't watching this (laughs) but it's uninteresting in every respect it's like no no color no dynamism yeah the subject matter is boring and can bards even play wish i don't you know i know they get spells but i presume they didn't get you know that spell (laughs) Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure about modern D and D actually. If you can get a ninth level spell, but traditionally, certainly a bard wouldn't be able to to cast wish. So, yeah, yeah it's, and it's, it's, it's a it's, weird choice all around. Yeah, it's yeah. three mana, and it's normally a ninth level spell that like mm. can is world altering in its implications. Yeah, and yeah, it's weird that they didn't do much with it. Um, I suppose you still have to play the you still have to pay the cost of the card that you're playing, though. I guess. Yeah, I mean, this. I, I don't think this is going to be banned. It's still going to be legal in, in tournaments. I think the rule is for tournaments that when it says outside the game, that's just your sideboard. Yeah. So, yeah. You, so you can bring 15 extra cards in, in tournaments and then you can just play from there. So you can't just like drive home and get a card and come back to the tournament for it. And I think that my, my, my biggest hope for this game actually was like Magic has so, so or for the set is that Magic has such a big art budget, especially compared mm-hmm. to D&D and they have so many good artists that... Uh, you would hope that they would kind of magic, you know, up the the art level of the D and D stuff. But instead, for at least a lot of them, it seemed to go the other way. There are a few few uh, um, illustrations that I like, but most of them are not so impressive. Does anyone have any cards on their list um, that are just? I love the art for this. The start art's great. Yeah, I, 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 I have, have any. I, I think. They all okay. feel very. I, I'm not. I, I'm going to apologize to Scrap now because I do not know what I'm talking about with art. But this, this the, to me, they no one, no the, one does. <laughs> to be honest, the magic art that I like is often quite like abstract or at least less, mm-hmm. less grounded in re- realism. I almost like it when they look a bit like a tarot card or something, or it's very kind of, um, yeah, like have that kind of abstract rather than trying to show something very grounded and real that's happening. And here, they they all seem very grounded in a way. Yeah. Which is weird to say about D and D, like, um, but they all feel very much like it's just showing a scene rather than like an idea or like Wish is a great yeah. example. Like, they could have made a, an image that represents Wish, yeah. without any like people in it or having to be like a, a particular scene in a tavern. Like, it, it feels a little bit like it, it feels like there's a very particular style for this set that is sort of like the style that I don't especially like for myself. Is that the fifth, fifth edition style? I, I admit I haven't 
looked through any of the fifth edition books. They do look quite but, fifth edition to me. Is that um, a, um, yeah. Notably, they, they do have uh, a bunch of alternate art versions that are meant to look kind of old school. And they got some more interesting artists for that. I don't, none of those really rock my world. I think they're a bit busy if they're trying to get that kind of old school in, energy. Yeah, they just a little bit, they feel a little bit, a little bit overdone. They're, they've definitely got some really nice ideas and execution, but yeah, like, and there's a lot of cards in this set that I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But there's just no cards that really like, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And mentioning often every set does have a couple of cards, which I'm generally impressed by. Mm. The, the, the one card that I, on my list here that I'm looking at that I for sure loved the art of was the swamps actually. The oh yeah. <laughs> and so some yeah, of they're... the non swamps were also pretty good, but, but the yeah. swamps are the ones that are on my screen right now. So yeah. yeah the lands in general, I think. We're good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I I actually didn't even consider the looking at the lands for like art, but yeah, actually, probably if I look, like, look. Only trouble with the lands is that often they really suffer at their small size. Like I think some of the land art, like if I saw it a lot bigger, I would be like, wow, yep, the, this is an um, art from this set that I think is gen generally quite good. So I also I also like the way that in this set they do little DM text for each of the lands. Again, it has like yeah. a weird thing oh, yeah, where yeah. It's, it's hard to figure out like what stance the text is coming from. Like, is the yeah. person talking to you or are you the, the game master? Um, but it is fun that they try and build that narrative into there. I like, I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, it's actually why I picked the, pick the swamp as one of them because basically mm -hmm. all the basic lands have an adventure prompt on them. I mean, you, you could even use them like, you know, if you're yeah. if you populate a hex crawl or something in the indie game, you could just take all the basic lands and shuffle them and like, you know yeah oh yeah that's a great idea i've talked about that before where you can use That'd be cool yeah or um be nice if more of sets had stuff like that but yeah, yeah how many how many are there in each set there's like five varieties per land type usually four in this one four four different ones all right so that's like what 20 different ones that's not too many um but that is a cool idea that you could use it as a as like a hex crawl or a square crawl or something i mean it's basically like a, even, if, even if you didn't want to use them literally as the map you know, you could just use it as like a D20 table of um, rumors or something. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The, the basic lands already have that, like that blank space is almost waiting for you to just write in yourself. So maybe Ooh, that's, that's true with all those basic lands I've got sat in a box. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is an idea for you, Ben, to deface more magic cards. Yes. yes. No, in the last yeah. one where I was defacing magic cards, I talked about that, that you can make like a square crawl out of the lands. Yeah. Um, add prompts. That's awesome. Well, if if we're going to get into like um, controversial takes, yeah, um, I am gonna unfortunately disagree with something you've said, Ben. I'm afraid. Um, the, the so the one I picked was Dragon Turtle because okay. um, even though it's not especially a D and D monster, I really think about as a specifically D and D thing. Um, so it's it's you know it's it's a big mon it's a big monster. It has flash, meaning it can come in and you can use it straight away. And it has an ability called Drag Below, which basically mm. means when it comes into the battlefield, um, it taps itself and another um, and an enemy, essentially. So, you know, the, the narrative is very clear. It's, it's, dra it's dragging them under for a turn. So they're both under the water. But the, the, the devil in me kind of wishes that that little bit of text wasn't there, the Drag Below. And it's mm. probably yeah. just part of something in my brain that always wants to, like, mm. just remove things until it, it doesn't work. And yeah. um, because I think the thing that I always like about magic cards is when you get that kind of when you when you read a card for the first time and you think, I don't I don't get what's happening. And then you kind of read it a second time and then you sort of the narrative clicks and it will be some weird effect. And you think, ah, it's because this monster is doing this. And it's it's a yeah. risky line to walk, because if you don't get to that aha moment, then you've just got a weird monster that doesn't make any sense. Um, but like I, I almost feel like the little drag below text like undermines the strength of the mechanics. Yeah, I'm going to say Ludo narrative just so I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Ludo narrative <laughs> cohesion of the yeah. emergent. Um, that is that enough buzzwords? Um, yeah, the, the kind of emerging narrative um, that comes out of the mechanics. I, I almost wish that that little bit of text wasn't there. Yeah, it's an interesting, like I said, a line to walk because. 
in some cases, what I, I know exactly what you mean, where you read a magic card and then it starts coming together, what it's supposed to mm. imply. But at the same time, adding text like that can also force the people making these cards to actually make the abilities mean something. Because every once in a while you get cards, mm. like the famous one is Questing Beast, uh, oh. which is a card from Throne of Eldraine, which people will not stop telling me exists. Yeah. And <laughs> like that's, it's wrecked all of my like Google searches for yeah. my channel. Because uh, people all complain about it all the time because it's just a card with like three or four different keywords and a bunch of superpowers yeah. that make no sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they did. So it does, I think, at least force them to a certain extent to make try and make something thematic or at least make the case mm. for the thematic ness. But I do like the experience you were talking about where you try and figure it out for yourself. Mm. Mm. Because there are some cards where they didn't keyword it, you know, and kind of let you figure out. And then these a lot where they did. Yeah. I am mainly being like, um, just being contradictory, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's, yeah. I, I, I kind of like, I, I think it, it fits in this set, but I think mm. on the whole, I would like to see it yeah. sparingly like this. I think that that's mm. the best way to go with it. Yeah, to, to riff off Dragon Turtle having Flash, um, I kind of wish the Bullet had Flash. Um, the Bullet's got a mechanic where it, if things die, it kind of, it gets bigger because presumably it's eating them. And it roughly fits, you know, but I feel like there's probably better kind of like scavenger monsters that would fit better. And I think a bullet, like its primary thing is it like surprises you from below, you know, and it can bury through the ground. And I think something like that it has flash and then it has first strike if you play it for its flash cost, you know, because it's like literally just bursting out and like attacking. I kind of thought the art was kind of interesting that they departed from you know like real world kind of features by kind of making it look like a mole or a shark or something instead they kind of give it almost like a, a earth moving machine kind of looking like mouth of kind of like furrows in it or something mm -hmm. i don't i think i would have preferred it if they then made it made the arms or you know the arms that you can see look a lot more like something that doesn't exist but i think the kind of mixture of this kind of mechanical kind of crest kind of thing and then these kind of like generic monster looking legs just kind of doesn't work for me if any monster should have flash the bullet should definitely have flash yeah yeah just to agree with you and that, and that would be really fun kind of like you know you know someone attacks you and you're like you know flash bullet <laughs> <Your> first strike <laughs> or if it could just like devour a really small creature like a creature that's like up to a two oh, yeah. two you just pop up swallow yeah. it and then just disappear yeah. again like, like it has first strike, and if the, I mean, if it was a card with a lot of a text, you know, if it has, if it gets first strike from flash, and the card that attacks is like below two toughness or something, then you know, you exile that other card, you know, it just eats it, it's gone. That'd be cool. It's interesting, like that, it doesn't have the little keyword explaining what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what That's the decision one. is why some do and some don't. I don't know. Yeah, I think they just literally were like, we know some people will hate this and some people will love it, so we're going to do it with X amount of cards. <laughs> Upset everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe the layout space constraint. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Is it crowded? It has a no. lot of flavor text. You could, yeah. you could get that, that giant down. paragraph of flavor text. Um, one I really like is uh, 50 feet of rope. Yeah. Because it's really simple, you know? Um, it, it's a rope. And you can do three different things. So I, I love the options where you, cards do multiple things because yeah. um, I feel like you get more st strategic possibilities there. So with the 50 feet of rope, you can uh, tap to uh, climb over a wall so walls don't block you. You can tap yeah. and do three and target creature doesn't untap, so you're tying them up. Um, or you can do four and tap and venture into the dungeon because you're rappelling down. Um, and yeah. So that really ties into the way that in D&D, in &D, ropes do everything and you're an yeah. idiot if you don't bring rope. So that's great. I, I heard people complain about that one in particular, that it got keyworded. People kind of wish it didn't get keyworded. So it was like a little bit of a puzzle, you know, where you're like, oh, why does it have those effects? And you're like, oh, because you could tie people up. And, you know, like that people, that one people actually wanted it to be like a, the joke not to be ruined by mm. the keywording. Yeah. And I kind of think that's almost fair. But I also kind of like how rope gets, keyword, gets keywords, like spells or dragon breath does, like, you know, it kind of elevates rope to this like fantastical item, which I think is cool. 
I would have liked to see more thing. mundane items like, you know, block of lard, cow drops, you know, was there a yeah, like foot burning pole? oil and stuff. I don't think there's a 10 foot pole. At least this hasn't been spoiled oh, yeah. yet. If it's not going to come out yet. But that's not really yeah. a fifth edition thing. Like no one uses 10 foot poles no. in 5A. But yeah, that's a good point. I wish there was more normal stuff. There's like thieves tools, but they're all kind of yeah. abstracted. 10 foot pole, like, you know, you, you like flip over a, a face down card or something and like peek at it or something. I, I was thinking of the 10 foot pole, you could like activate other people's artifacts. <laughs> oh, yeah. like you're poking them from across the table. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is a card for check for traps, but the the, the rogue yeah. in the art is not using a pole, unfortunately. Yeah. No. Another missed opportunity. I was looking at the one. That, it looks like they've used saw blades for the uh, saw blades, sword blades for the spike, and I, I don't know. I was just kind of curious if that was a deliberate decision by the artist to kind of suggest that whoever had made the trap had just used pre-existing blades, or you know, because they've got like yeah, because there's their swords, they've got edges, despite the fact those edges are unlikely to cut anyone because they're just coming out vertically. So they all not need is a spike. I think there's some other set that already used trap as a mechanic, right? Yeah, it was Zendikar again. So that was the same one yeah. that had it. That, so Zendikar had a focus on like adventures. So they had a mechanic for yeah. traps for um, quests, which were like things that you had to like, almost like a little objective that you had to do multiple times. And when you'd done it enough times, you would get like a reward. Yeah. And, and it also had the, yeah, it had the traps and it had the the party mechanic. So it that's why it's so weird because that, that set is like, mm -hmm. That they must have like been wishing that that didn't exist <laughs> once, they yeah, the, yeah. once they got the go ahead yeah. for the D and D set. Um, yeah, it's really strange, especially when because the, the, the whole party system was like based on warriors, like having like a warrior, rogue, and mage, and a cleric, yeah, like, wizard in in your in your like um, battlefield. Yeah, and you've got this completely different version of like being a cleric. Yeah, that's just tied to you. Um, so yeah, it, it is strange, um, but I guess you can see why it's there. And I don't think anyone really loved that party mechanic. And I think it was quite hard to pull off and just no one really liked it. The designers didn't seem to like it. Players didn't really like it. So I can see why they definitely didn't want to go back there. You know, they may have even been relieved because they're like, oh, this is an idea that we may have like used for forgotten rounds, but we already tried it. Already know it doesn't work and we can, yeah, move on. Yeah. Okay. Let's do Mind Flare next. Ooh. Um, Cause this is, this is a weird, it's a mixture one, but the art's decent. Um, I kind of like it. I mean, it's not nothing super creative, but it's not mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, and the effect is, it's cool. It's what I would want in a like a blue control deck. It fits the psionic, you know, the stuff that people know about mind flares. But again, it's kind of a weird color choice. Should it really be blue? I would probably have chosen blue black. Mm. Yeah. If anything, if anything was going to be blue, black, I think a mind flare, yeah. Right. And I mean, it's supposed to be one of the most evil creatures in the D and D world, I guess. Yeah. So. Is the actual mind flare? Oh, okay, never mind. This is the creature. Yeah, you're right. Huh. I mean, like blue is pure control, and this is like as controlly as you get. So, like mm -hmm. thematically, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's it's otherwise like it's it's a, I would say that's a quibble in this case because it, it's not like it doesn't fit blue. It clearly yeah. does, um, and the flavor is good and. You know, I mean, uh, I think part of the, the, the theme of magic that they explore continuously is that the colors aren't, none of them are really entirely good or bad. So I guess black, yeah. you know, leans, yeah. and white leans good, but yeah. um, you know, there, there's some ambivalence about the moral status of all of the colors. And it, but also this is the only card I think where the uh, yeah. ability that triggers on entering the battlefield that I liked. All of the other ones yeah. felt really lame to me. I'm trying to remember, I think there was a, dra I think there was a one of the dragons had a cool, into the battle effect, but I think it might have been a when um, a target player takes damage or when it in, it attacks, and now I can't remember which one it was. Yeah, I, I think all, all of the colored dragons have an enter the battlefield effect, which I think is supposed yeah. to represent their breath weapon. It just yeah. it seems like a uh, um, you know dragons should be able to breathe fire more than once. Yeah, maybe the the classic D and D ones that you know could, could breathe three times a day, and then that was it. Yeah, it's true. I, I didn't put it in my list, but there is a card that's just dragon fire. And then you play the card and you can reveal a dragon in your hand. Um, and it does damage equal to like what that dragon has, yeah. which I thought was a cool um, 
thematic way of doing that. Like you're playing dragon fire and then the dragon isn't even on, in the game. He's in your hand. But he's yeah, still yeah. breathing fire on your opponents and then you put him yeah. back in your hand again. Like just yeah. like he's passing by. Yeah. yeah calling dragon by dragons. Yeah. One um, sort of potentially um, controversial thing that we haven't talked about is the dice. So I've chosen critical oh, yeah. hit. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, when I saw this thing about the dice being in there and rolling a d20, um, I think like a lot of other people, I thought, well, it's, it, it's kind of, they're, they're kind of just using it like, um, flipping a coin, but like yeah. just, just not quite 50, 50. Yeah. Um, and it felt kind of disconnected from the type of randomness that I like. I, I accept that there's a lot of randomness in magic to do with the draw and everything like that, but mm. they seem to lean towards the idea that rolling low is bad and rolling high is good. When I feel like yeah. it might have been more interesting to just have like unpredictable effects, um, yeah. so that you're sort of you're still dealing with the randomness, but it's not just oh I rolled badly. Um, but then critical hit kind of flicked a switch for me where I thought so the the way critical hit works is you get you give a creature double strike, um, but then once that's in your graveyard, whenever you roll a natural twenty, you get to take that card back into your hand. So it's it's the kind of card that like makes you want to build a deck around it almost because now you want to oh, yeah. roll as many dice as possible um oh. and, and there's another one somewhere that lets you i think there's one that lets you like have advantage on rolls or add something to rolls i can't remember how it works but yeah. um but i think if you having a deck that's based around the idea that you're going to be rolling lots of d20s that appeals to me more and, oh. that, and that's the problem with a lot of magic cards is i'll, I'll see a card in isolation and i'll think oh what's this it, it's kind of a bit boring or it's, it doesn't really appeal to me but I think it's it's about finding a, a home for it, isn't it? And finding a, a use for it. Um and and that and that's tricky when you're um trying not to spend lots of money on collecting the whole set. But um but yeah, I would be interested to hear what, what, what other people think about the dice rolls in this. I mean, the our magic has always had the twenty sided die for your die counter or your life counter. Right? So it's always been kind of built into it. Um so I guess it's a natural fit to ask people to start rolling dice. I mean, you have to roll a lot of dice to make this a reliable <clears throat> card though, right? To get it to return to your hand on natural 20. Yeah. I'm not sure how many other cards there are in the in the set that have you rolling dice a lot. I think yeah, I think you'd struggle to like even if you had had a game that went for like 15 turns or something, you know? And you're like rolling a d20 like on most of those turns i think it's still struggle i think it's just like to have an it's like you can't really rely on it happening it's just a nice like extra thing and i think that's the design space they're sort of playing with with the d20s is they've got randomness and uh, but they don't necessarily have randomness that is like a real long shot randomness mm -hmm. you know because like I mean, I guess there's always drawing the perfect card at the perfect time or something, but I guess people build around that. But yeah, with the rolling 20 mechanic, it means you can have all these cards that do a thing, but every now and again, they just do something crazy, you know? Mm. Yeah, so I guess this set is kind of tapping into the sweeness of D&D &D, yeah. um, to that extent. Where, because I saw, well, we haven't showed any of these cards yet, but there are some cards where it has like a whole random table on them. And there's like a whole bunch of different effects that can happen. And the 20 is always just something completely nuts. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how people are going to feel about that. Because in, you know, bigger tournament games, you just roll a 20 and then you can completely turn the game. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> people, people are going to be mad no matter what you do. It's a good yeah. story to tell, right? I mean, that's actually yeah. the good thing about, about the yeah. 20 in some ways. But I actually liked it. I think it would work better for casual games because in casual games, yeah. that sort of thing would be a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah. And in, in some ways, actually, I think it's a better D20 mechanic than the D&D &D D20 mechanic. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't have whiffs for any of them, right? Yeah. It's like a, a partial success mechanic yeah. where you have a total failure, a partial failure, a partial success, and a total success, which is actually more yeah. interesting than just a yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any cards that have a eat on rolling a one card, you know? And that's probably a deliberate thing that they wanted like those moments of like, oh my God, my car did that. That was great. Rather than like, ah, oh, like everything's going wrong. So that's so not really one, D&D. There's, there's one about opening a chest or something. I'm trying to, um, yeah. So the treasure chest um, has your already 20. And if you, if you get a 20, obviously it's really good. 
mm-hmm. 10 to 19 is pretty good. Two to nine is okay. And then, well, actually, they're all pretty good, except number one, uh, if you roll a one, then the chest is trapped and you lose three life. Oh, okay. Cool. So and, they do have a... Yeah, there, that there, there's a, one for uh, <laughs> the deck of many things, which is a little bit like that too. Yeah. Where like, I think all of the things that you can roll are really good. Um, yeah. But if you... You do have to roll a d20 and you subtract like the number of cards in your hand. I don't have it in front of me, but like it has a possibility of going really badly for you, um, which I guess makes sense for that card. But it's yeah. criminal that the deck of many things in this card game involves rolling a die instead of pulling a card. <laughs> yeah. It should yeah. be, it should be you pulling a random card out of your deck. That's what it should be. And then yeah. you read something on that card yeah. to give you the answer, like the amount of mana on it or something. Mm. Uh, it, it, yeah, it has if the result is zero or less, discard your hand. So it, it doesn't have anything to do with rolling a natural one, but it effectively has if you roll if roll a one, you know, um, and you've got one card in your hand, you know, one or more cards in your hand, you're going to have a negative effect. Well, something we haven't talked about um, is the the drow, which is quite a big thing. In Forgotten Realms, that I can see why both wizards and um, well, I guess it's all, it's all wizards now, isn't it? Um, uh, kind of have stayed away from, but they had Loth, they have a Drider, and then these two cards, which could be Drow, but it's sort of hard to tell. These uh, Chalasara, Moon Dancer, and the there's a Rune Blade, which both could be Drow, they could just be like. Al standing somewhere with the lighting is a bit funny. Um, and yeah, I can kind of see why they're wanting to avoid that, but it's sort of interesting that they had some of the most iconic stuff to do with Drow, which is, you know, the Drider and Loth. But, you know, otherwise yeah. kind of deli- went out of their way to kind of like avoid having that because of all the sort of pushback from, you know, the, the imagery and wording to do with drow like echoing or repeating that that's been used for like real life people so one of the swamps has drow reference ah okay so you expected to meet hostile drow in this ancient yeah. ancient room but they fled long ago with darkness <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think the only um, is the only is the only real drow just drizzed or however you say his name is he referred to as a drow in the on the card. elf in here, which I think oh. is just because they already have elves as a, a yeah. tribe, I guess, in magic, yeah, as a creature type. Um, so I guess again, this is another one of those things where it's about allowing things to be built into people's existing elf decks, I suppose, rather than creating yeah. a new creature type. Actually, I mean, they're elves in the DD world too, right? So, yeah, incorrect, yeah, yeah. And I noticed half elves, but they don't have a half elf type, they just have both the human and the elf type, which I thought was yeah. cool. And I think driders are probably a, a better choice than drow anyway, just because they're more visually striking. Yeah. Um, they're more it's more exciting to play a, an elf spider than just an elf. I kind of wish it didn't have a spider summoning mechanic and had some kind of, if you have an elf in your graveyard, you know, exile that elf and then play the drider, you know, like a sense of what mm. love does so that you, you know, this elf has failed you and so you punish it and, you know, but turning it into a drider would have been fun. Thanks for joining me, everybody. And uh, check also below for links to all of my fine guests' stuff. If you want to check out their blogs and the stuff that they've written. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.